wonder what makes the greats great what makes the successful successful what makes the brilliant brilliant our tuesday meetups with the celebrities of pharma industry and science are your one stop shop to all these answers and more join us for pies of life an initiative of the biopatrika industry mentorship program where we bring your dream mentors to you quite an experience working with customers across you know whether it be amdabad whether it be delhi whether it be shanta reliance etc it's been it's been quite an experience and then of course the first uh, startup uh, which was which which is so different from the second startup uh, the first one was in the biosimilar space uh, between 2007 and 2012 and that's really when um, it is a really uh, you know nice team of 27 people we were located in pinia and uh, pinia was the only industrial hub we could afford then because uh, jigni bomasandra was unaffordable uh, right and so uh, so we yeah we were located in pinia and fortunately that's really where all the vendor partners were so it made a lot of sense and uh, yeah we developed a, a pipeline which we ultimately strategically sold to strides your family with strides and your family with stellis right so the the entity that you know i created called in biopro is now called stellis and in, and it's with top and it's a part of the strides group right so the first uh, the the interesting part of the first startup was uh, you know i needed investor money in biotech there's nothing that happens without money i needed investor money uh, in 2007 this is and uh, that's when i was pregnant and i didn't think that you know investors would want to invest in one of the founders who just pregnant and then one year later they put in money and what to happen to their right so i kind of hid it but i was pregnant and <laughs> i went in pitched <laughs> thinking that you know this is this is these are like best kept secrets and i how foolish is that but anyway but the fun story to tell because i think axel's kind of uh, you know been supported me throughout the first one and now the second uh, one but it's been an amazing learning uh we were on our own and then we became strategic partners with strides and when we did it with strides it was like working with biocon all over again where somebody's telling you what to do but it is interesting because different people telling me what to do and uh differently telling me what to do but it was nice uh we we did a strategic merger and then we sold it and then of course zumator zumator story of family with i guess from the interactions we have had with ada bycara or biocon or you know from the website uh Uh, you know zumotors kind of differentiated itself with platforms with the immuno oncology pipeline and now now of course having nk focus uh it's also taught me in my own journey that uh money is not everything but money is extremely important in the entrepreneurial journey especially in a biotech company and uh, in 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 you know bio biologics like ours uh, you have to burn a lot of money before you see light of day of development of an asset right and it's not like any of these kind of e-com platforms where you quickly set up a platform and you see traction on the site etc so uh, i think even in even in this i think it's the investor education that's also happened investors have learned biotech i think because of folks like us and they're continuing to learn it from us so uh it's it's been a it's been an interesting learning curve for them for us and for me personally kind of getting to know different people and then of course the pandemic everything changed all that you thought you knew in a particular way uh has absolutely kind of stood its test you know? <laughs> and then and, and then now we have a new normal so kind of uh, uh i think learning to pivot all over again with this new normal and see where that goes so that's the meandering story i have told you happy to uh, you know answer questions or stuff like that yeah which you might have yeah so so go ahead as usual if you can ask questions raise your hand and um i, I was wondering i guess the toughest part about being a scientist and then moving to the business and everything is the transition so what kind of strategies did you implement in your uh, environment to help you transition from being a scientist to and i i guess it started with going to i i i m and then from there uh becoming completely focused into the business end of the pharmaceutical industry so well the, a partial answer to that is yes i was exposed to the kind of you know the incubator cell in i m which is the nsr yep. cell the nsr cell is not focused in biotech but completely focused in you know kind of other avenues 
Uh, what is that? But in my mind somewhere, I thought that getting an MBA under the belt would also mean you kind of get the business side of things, right? And okay. you know, get to do portfolio management and you kind of get to do supposedly cooler, like traveling kind of stuff and things like that. That really didn't, that I must say that didn't happen. But what it did is it expensively gave me uh, an avenue to network, which was not available before. Uh, otherwise, you know, personally, I think an MBA is a national waste of time. Uh, you know, it just it just tells you a little bit of everything, and and then you you know you go around expensively networking, etc. Which is, I guess, one of the things that an MBA does. But yeah, so to kind of get to your question, I think uh, there was a that at, at that point in time when you know I was just finishing up with Malipur, uh, you know, and this is this is back in kind of two thousand six, right? Is when I realized that there is a certain need with regard to bigger biopharmas wanting, you know, biosimilar development done, either they were investing to kind of look into their own teams carving out and kind of reaching that potential, or they were willing to look at partners, right? At that point, they were looking to look at partnerships. And for me, what it did uh, teach me was I spent a couple of months with Evistagen and Evistagen had this relationship with Cipla and Cipla was looking to do a pipeline of biosimilars. That really never realized or saw light of day because of other reasons. But uh, it did kind of teach us and a couple of others who wanted to do the startup saying there is a need, right? And there is, there is, there is capability by means of scientists. So this, this whole thing can come together. Thankfully, you know, I've been surrounded by like my parents who are from, you know, who teach in IM, who, uh, who are chartered accountants themselves. So I knew how it would be to set up a company by means of, you know, all of the mandatory statutory stuff that was taken mm -hmm. care of. So yeah, so for the longest time, and even now, my mother continues to kind of uh, oversee uh, the financial, uh, you know, kind of uh, accuracy, I want to say, and stringency of what we do. So that, that helps. Yeah. Um, as you had mentioned, um, um, initially, you have to burn a lot of money in biotech before you can actually see any result. So in this aspect, what was your biggest challenge while speaking to investors? Uh, yeah. Being a startup industry, what was... So I, th I think one, the investors had no clue what they were investing in, especially when I went to them. And even now, I think the filter I use in India is I don't think they have a clue about pure biotech investment. And I think it's a different slice altogether in the US or in Europe where the, where the markets are more mature and there are specific investors who go after specific products. Uh, that's one filter to use. This, the, the other part of it is that uh, I think if you're able to show them some amount of proof of concept, whether it was done back in a lab or whether it was licensed in, right? That is something that the investor is kind of willing to punt on saying, okay, here is something, right? Either the founder and a couple of scientists have it and they've done it in a very credible lab or they have publications and papers to themselves that they're willing to show. That's one kind of leap of faith, right? Saying that, yeah, I need to put in money even without they really kind of having anything to show, so to speak. So for us, in the first one, we did some work in IASC in Raghavan's lab. And uh, of course, the second one was because of the first one, they believed that you could cut it. And so they put in money. Uh, so yeah, but we did incubate at CCAM. So that was important too. So I think the incubator ecosystems become important, especially when you want to start off something. And if you have these clusters ready, and, I, and you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I want to say a lot of programs running, right? Mm -hmm. or with uh, regard to entrepreneurship within these kind of clusters, and when you kind of hook on to them, that's, that's very helpful. Hello. So um, I'm just completing my uh, PhD from Actric. I work on uh, cancer biology on a pediatric uh, brain tumor. So um, I wanted to know uh, when you hire someone, so do you think uh, PhD is a you know a important criteria for the scientist post uh, in your um, uh, firm? And do you... Uh, prefer someone who has a experience post PhD? Right. So I think uh, hiring is a very important question and it also depends upon the stage of the startup or, or even other companies, right? And I can give you an experience with regard to startups. It definitely depends upon the stage of the startup and, and, and what the startup is trying to build out. So for example, for us in Zimotor, when we knew we were trying to build platforms and these were antibody engineering platforms, we definitely wanted folks who had some kind of experience with that, 
right? And so we went around hiring two positions with experience and they were PhD postdocs with experience. And then we hired out two, you know, which had, let's say like, like an MTech or an MSE, but with say one year of experience, et cetera. So we, we ensured that it should suit our purpose, right? With regard to whom we bring in. And then of course there is, you know, we go across to like the IITs or we go across to a, any of the, you know, kind of other colleges, so to speak. And then we hire freshers so that we would train them and then that would suit mm. us. I just wanted to ask that was it challenging to decide upon your pipeline since you know most of the Indian companies are right now are in the race of making biosimilars and developing because it's, it's not easy but you yeah, definitely don't have such challenges which a novel program has. So what was your experience regarding uh, your pipelines so, so mostly immuno-oncology part? I think pipelines are ever changing and pipelines are so dependent upon funding and who is looking at it at which point, right? So for example, if you're in the US and you have, let's say Atlas as an investor on your board, they would dictate your pipeline. I don't think you have a choice, right? They're very focused. They know what, you know, this company can do. They will even put CEOs onto the board so that, you know, they kind of very focusedly work on some, some assets. In the, especially in the immunology space. But for us sitting here in India, I think it had to do with we differentiating with other like T cell, B cell companies or the gene therapy companies, and then seeing if you have a platform, what else can you do? You know, for us too, and Naren knows this, we went to, you know, a biotech firm in Boston called Rikard Consulting, and we shopped around for a pipeline for assets. And, you know, and these are all, we, we're, not a, we're not a, you know, kind of target discovery company, right? We work on validated targets. So we went around like looking at 120 targets, narrowed it down to 20 and then narrowed it down to four. And then the question keeps arising, how did you choose this four, right? So we chose the four with some amount of market intelligence. We had to invest in it. We had to kind of spend a lot of money to go figure out are those the targets that a startup like ours would work on, et cetera. Because you could become irrelevant in one year, right? I mean, somebody could right. do half of it. Or, yeah. Every so, day and your discovery comes. Correct. So we took a punt on saying, let's do something that's at least four or five years ahead, right? Something that's less studied. And I think to that extent, uh, Naren would agree, we chose the NK space, at least the NK space is not new. We chose a target that is kind of less studied, so to speak, and, and then a list of targets. And then we went around kind of wrapping science around it. So that, that was an approach. But even today we get asked, I mean, why have you chosen this target? You know, you could have gone after something that's a lot easier. Why would you want to prove this biology? Yeah. 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 On the personal front, ma'am, uh, I wanted to ask, like, how you maintain your fitness level? And I have read your blogs, like, you run, you are still so fit and all. So we, uh, right now only we feel that you, and mostly we are so lazy, like, if we try to do something also it won't like you know go for more than two three days that's how it is so, yeah. Be be yeah give us some tips about it <laughs> yeah before kavita answers that question because i know as modestly she won't she won't say this but since the lockdown she has run uh, seven if not eight full marathons 82 wow wow <laughs> awesome <laughs> So yeah, so I think that's that's a that's a that's an, another level of madness. But uh, you know, <laughs> our obsession with the running, you know, we I, we keep hearing the running lots, keep hearing all these things. But yeah, so I, I've been athletic throughout and kind of chose running, and I think I've chosen a kind of close knit uh, community of friends also, and therefore you you know kind of socialize like that. And so kind of running is a little bit like that. But I think the comparison uh, that I always use to a startup or, you know, kind of doing something a little more, I want to say long term, is the endurance training. You know, we run for hours literally aimlessly, right? I mean, that's uh, if you run a marathon, people wonder why. What is the objective of punishing yourself like that? Sometimes a startup is like that. There's no end in sight and you keep going like that. So I think that's good analogy. Wow, you related that to your work. So. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Purana. And uh, I was also doing a PhD, but uh, now I've decided not to continue. So I would like to know whether how will it affect uh, not having a degree? How will it affect if I uh, choose to go into industry? Right. So I, I mean, this is this is something Narena and I keep chatting about. I don't have a PhD myself, 
I only have experience, uh, right? So, uh, and sometimes the grass is always greener on the other side with regard to, you know, kind of opportunities that you see that you have a PhD and therefore you get it, et cetera. But at the end of the day, there is nothing like experience, right? Whether you have a PhD or don't have a PhD, you know, you, the experience, whether you work in a lab or a company is that, and nobody can take that away. Uh, coming to your question about, you know, what would probably weigh one over the other, I think only context can answer that, right? Like for example, contextually, if you wanted to be in academia, then I guess a PhD is most required. But then if Absolutely. you kind of transition out and kind of experience either a startup or, or like kind of larger biopharmas, there would be levels of course of hiring that they would want. But I think today with what is happening around, I, I don't think a PhD is a gating process. At least that's what I think, right? I mean, Narin, Narin probably has no experience on this. But I can tell you from a startup, it's not a gating experience, yeah. So basically, uh, most of us are doing PhD in basic science. So after PhD, if we are uh, trying for startup, any kind of startup, but problem is we have no industrial experience till now. So do you think before doing for going for startup, we should have some industrial experience whether it will affect having a industrial experience before the startup with will affect as in it will be helpful or not. So the, this is my take on it. I believe that if you're sure you don't want to be in academia and you want to kind of come out of the PhD and not do like a postdoc and get into a startup, there has to be a flavor that you have kind of experienced it, right? So whether you yeah. want to intern for six months at a startup or intern for six months, or even at a biopharma company, whichever it is, I think that amount will also shape what you want. You might even work for a startup and say, this is not for me. I want right. to go to a nine to five job and somebody to pick me up and drop me. And this is not the unpredictability that I want. Right. I mean, right. Uh, a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I would think so. It's like you're wrecking something. Um, uh, this is a bit of a personal uh, on the personal front. What made you want to leave a nine to five job to join a startup? The what drove that transition? The nine to five job was not uh, was not suiting me fine because there was at, at that point, again, context, right? At that point in that company, they were just not too many things coming together that even technically we were delivering, right? So there was no purpose. When there is no purpose, either you get it right or you know you make sure the company gets it right. Somewhere something has to change or give, so mm -hmm. to speak. So that didn't happen for me, right? And therefore, I found myself, I want to say, fortunately, at the right time, at the right place, where there was a need for biosimilar development. And therefore, you know, kind of investors were looking for it and they didn't know what was happening and they decided to invest. So a lot of things kind of came together. There is no one recipe, right? Saying mm -hmm. all the stars will align and therefore you will be successful. At least I don't believe in that. There is a, there is a bit of the right time, some luck and a lot of hard work. Yeah. So how do you keep motivated yourself? I think you're constantly smiling and you're just bringing positive energy, <laughs> which I think we are lacking. I was gripping because I felt. <laughs> so what is your mantra or what do you do to keep motivated? Uh, so, so there, are, I mean, this is this, I mean, the, pers the persona is very, and there are many ups and downs, but then now, uh, I think one thing is, especially with entrepreneurship, right? I mean, which which is, is and I keep sharing these stories and, you know, of course, Narin's my mentor. And so he's heard this. There are, there are some really, really down moments for us, right? As founders mm -hmm. or as part of startups where you don't think that this is going to work, right? And you would like, you know, which side of the bed did I get upon to think that this could be a success? And, you know, I'm 43. Why would I want to waste my life trying to believe that investors, my team or everything will get their act together and this is going to be hugely successful, right? I mean, there are those down moments where there is so much self-doubt that this would work. Then there are these moments where we are like, if you didn't take a chance now in life, when will you, right? And those are, the, those, are those, you know, kind of, uh, I want to say stitch together moments that kind of keep it together. And then very importantly, once you build something for some time, you are responsible for it. I am responsible for investor money. I am responsible for my people of 36. We're a team of 36, right? So I'm, I, I'm therefore, I, I hang on to that responsibility with a lot of respect saying, I'm, you know, there, there are people's lives in question here, right? And there are people who have vested in me, trusted me and believe that this would work. And so for that, I have to get it right, 
right? So there are a lot of these factors. I want to think that, you know, kind of keep it going. And then there is the uniqueness, right, in India. Nobody is doing what we're doing in India, I want to say right now, right? There are multiple people doing different things. And so there is this whole uniqueness that, you know, the team brings in. And then we keep thinking it's going to cut it. And I, well, with the industry feedback, I think we'll cut it. But there is a very touch and go moments for us, right? It's, it's, and startups are never, never secure with the money. Except, of course, I keep telling Kiran that's the most secure startup if it's going to be Baikara or Immunil, <laughs> but that's not true, too. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, what is your definition for success? And how do you take care of risk associated with such startups where you are completely uh, getting into a completely new thing which is not so known in India or Indian culture or Indian scientific culture? So how do you take care of that risk associated with it? Right. So one is uh, risk is risk. You know, one has to take a bet. Uh, very rarely is it cushioned. Then if it's so cushioned, it is not called risk, right? Then everybody could have done it. Then why why are you doing it, right? So that's one thing. I mean, that, that that that's like a that's like a how do you say a road less traveled, so to speak. Either you have an appetite for that, or you don't have an appetite. If you do have an appetite, stick to it, right? And then kind of build yourself around that because you you know you went down that journey of saying it's fine that i don't know tomorrow what's going to happen right mm -hmm. having done that in the second startup it was definitely not the same as the first one first one was uncertain in its own ways the second one now is being uncertain in its own ways but there is a lot of surety around certain things which you have to build is it surety on the science then build it out right they're very sure about our science is it unsurety around the money? Yeah, money will come, money will go, but there will be people who believe in the science and therefore it will go ahead, right? So that's one part of it. So I, I don't know, at least in my, in my kind of words, I don't know uh, if there is so much certainty in what we do in startups, right? I mean, it, it has a certain momentum, it goes ahead, there will be markets, those markets may believe this will work and then you might succeed. It is most possible that certain startups won't do well because those markets don't exist anymore in these times, right? And you have seen this. In this COVID times, there are things that never worked and we thought those industries would work, right? So I think th those are the two. Uh, I don't know if I've covered everything, but that's the risk part of it. I think um, certainty versus defining certainty versus uncertainty is a very good thought. I actually wrote it down. <laughs> um, any other uh, thoughts? So, so Kavita, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your uh, your journey a little bit because I think that'll um, enable people to think about the question. Because one thing that I, I see that none none of them have asked a question around what it would take to be an entrepreneur themselves. Like, what what are the factors if someone wanted to start their own business? What what should they be thinking of? Maybe maybe right. you can a journey and then that'll that'll steer some questions around that space. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, and since I think everybody is in the space of biotech, biology broadly, I, I think, you know, kind of this is, I, I can give you more context to it, right? So in the, in the first startup, when we were trying to build a pipeline of biosimilars, the first thing that we kind of did, and this was just three of us, the first thing we did was, if you have to go to an investor, you need to show some data, right? I mean, you need to show that either you have some clones with you, or you need to show that you've already done something. So all of this was not there with us. So we we started doing clone development, and we put in money, our money, you know, kind of into this. We got two scientists in ISC to kind of work on this, and we did show some clone development data. Right. Of course, the investor did not understand what that clone meant, but then it is important for us to kind of have that conversation with them saying this has the potential for possible licensing, because at that point, licensing was the game. So the, the, the important part of the construct of even going to an investor saying we needed external money because we wanted to build out a lab, we wanted to hire people, we wanted a pipeline, etc., was to show that initial data saying, you know what you're going to do. Right. So we did that with uh, we did that with two products actually back then. One was parathyroid hormone PTH that we were doing, right, a microbial asset, and we were able to kind of uniquely show some stuff. And then we started working on rituximab, and at that time on a DG44 cell line. Now, of course, all the fancy expression systems exist, and that time it was not there. So we went around doing this, and we had just some milligrams of stuff. We purified it, and we knew all those processes. So I think that clicked. 
that you knew what you, you i mean you you can't fake it to make it you have to know solidly what you have to do right if this faking to making it is a very short term thing and then it's not going to it, it people will believe you for probably 5 minutes right and after that you know once you poke holes in this whole thing it will fall flat so be very solid right in when if it's data be very solid with the data if it has to be an audience that is not scientific make sure you have enough market information because they know the markets right and therefore they're going to question you on the market so you should spend some time and money possibly in getting market information and then of course it's important to see uh, you know kind of who puts their best foot forward right if you are going to be the liaison with, within the investor or you know kind of a partner then you've got to know what to say to them and that the other people need to kind of play their act so this is a bit like a theatrical performance right who takes center stage at which point and who kind of plays at the background everybody can't you know kind of then it's in cacophony and not symphony right so kind of the a symphony actually not in you should use that <laughs> i love it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's, that's a couple of uh, things that uh, at least in the first startup we got together uh, in the, and and then of course you build out a pipeline then you have some customers then you know you know you know you kind of do very sincere customer engagement you also do some amount of use case with them everything is not about upfront milestone money is coming to you right you got to prove that you know you're good so one of the things we've started doing is kind of working with important partners like example you probably know vijay kuchru right he's been on the uh, biocon kind of uh, scientific advisory uh, board so we have worked with vijay kuchru's lab in, in now on a novel cytokine uh, that he wanted developed etc and we have we have kind of got a couple of hits from our uh, library we have given it to him etc so we that was done literally free right all of this because we wanted to build out this relationship with the hope that ultimately when he does a publication we are included in that right so everything is not about you know kind of getting a partner there's money involved there's also the relationship to be built so that's one part of it or uh, the science is you know kind of has to be absolutely kind of solid i think the other part is to get your team the team has to be very very vested right um, if 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 you if you get a motley mix of people from industry people from academia and then a couple of freshers who see your vision and then they are going forward in being a part of the journey and we have some amazing people who have stayed like 7 years with this gig and they they ultimately kind of see what is the end game correct and 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 imagine being vested is also being vested in the risk of it right the end game may not turn out to be like the way we envisioned it to be it could be you know kind of a sliver of that the fact that they have the appetite for it and you kind of ensure you give them esops you give them you you build out the risk appetite for them too right it's not about just the money so it's all of, all about how participated they are in it etc so these are the broad constructs i want to say in kind of this journey at least what i've learned with this i am sure i have a lot more to learn yeah yeah so any any questions on the entrepreneurial part or any other point uh ma'am when you actually you said like you approach people from iisc and uh, stuff for your initial uh, part of your uh, journey so what was their response like when a completely new person who is entering into entrepreneurship is asking for help from the scientists what was their reaction or what was their approach were they positive or what questions they had in their mind when they uh, when you act- actually approached them right so one is i think once you're in this space any of the academic things are not new you're kind of familiar with them right otherwise you're not going to go to them so this is not like one of those greenfield things where you completely kind of jump into the waters you know you're kind of trying to you know swim around that's not what it is you zone in very clearly you use the connections and the contacts that you already have and then you kind of go through them to do it so i think and we know this right we even even as individuals even if you have to kind of apply for something we automatically do enough research around you know whom you're approaching why you're talking to them what is the lab that they work with what are they working with etc and see what are the connects you already have so that foot in the door we had right and that's how we went yeah and and we do that even now for example with narin like we use his connections in the us for introductions and then we go across kind of speaking to multiple collaborators scientists cc's etc so we need that we all do but we ensure that we we don't get into an introduction without doing enough research of what that other person is doing Okay. Then does uh, marketing plays uh, is 
one major role, like the way your website is built or other features, basically how much you put in information there. And also we definitely, we get attracted to say some site, like if Amazon has put its buy similar very clearly this thing. So I, even I have seen your website. So how much role you feel all these plays? I, I think in these uh, coronial times, as I want to call it, uh, it, it's more important to be out there with regard to what you do, because uh, with more people spending more time of either on either social media or relevant media, so to speak, to see what they want, it's, it's very important to be out there, whether it be your own profile or how much of your information you want to put out there or how much of the company information is it the startup that you want to put out there. I think that's the major mode of, you know, kind of information and communication right now. Yeah, I want to know that how important it is uh, to succeed in the initial phase of a startup because your uh, subsequent uh, fundings from investors is based on that. Uh, especially if you're a uh, if you're a new person to this field with minimum experience. Right. So I think uh, you know, kind of success is what you define as your endpoints, right? And in biotech, you already know this. If you're in the cell line development space, if you've proven that your product that is, let's say an antibody that you're developing in your cell line has reached a particular title, and that is going to be defined as your endpoint, and then you're going to go to the investor, you have to meet that endpoint, right? And then you go to the investor and you can call that success. But if you decide, I want to portray, let's say, uh, you know, a pipeline of four assets and all I need is hits from a library and that is enough and I can go ahead to an investor because that investor is looking for that, then that is an endpoint and therefore that is success, correct? So I think it's important to filter what you, what you outline to yourself as milestones of success. And that's very important because the investor wants to see that clarity, right? They want to see how clear are you in going after what you're telling us that you're going after. So those would be the kind of things I would say as, as a success point that one would want to achieve even for the investor's sake. Hmm. Somehow, is there a discussion that uh, happens? Sorry. Uh, 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 yeah. Sorry, uh, I was just wondering, is that a discussion that happens between you and the investor defining those milestones uh, prior to uh, the investment happening? So I think the discussion of milestones has to happen with your team first because okay. the team is going to deliver on milestones. And then once you think it's realistic, you go to the investor and say, here are the milestones. They might jump the whole thing and say, you know, come to us after two milestones, right? Don't come to us when you're just saying you've got kids of the library. It is possible that they could do that, right? So I think calibrating what are the milestones for what you're developing out, especially let's say in biotech, let's say all the way from sequence, you know, till let's say a 10 liter batch. If you consider that as three milestones, then you define that and go to them. And they might say, that's fine. All this is fine. Come to us when you've achieved 10 liter scale, you know, so that, okay. that, so that's a conversation you have after you have internal clarity. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, how to, uh, choose... Remaining question. Yeah. Tripti, go ahead. And then yeah. Surekha. Uh, how to choose the right kind of investor for your uh, startup? Because since you said that the investors in India are not very much familiar with the kind of work we do. So, uh, like, how do you approach an investor? Like, uh, I mean, uh, if that investor has some basic knowledge or understanding of the field, or it could be someone who hardly has any understanding. So I want to say that the reason we flipped in Zumotor from being an Indian company to a US company until today, you know, it's 2020 on why we did it, uh, is that we thought that the investors in the US, and I believe it is so, are very mature and they look at biotech or biologics in a certain way. And therefore, because of the investors, the IPs, assets, et cetera, we flipped to being a US company. So today I'm a Boston-based US company with a wholly owned subsidiary in India. I did that for the same purposes that you're asking this question that I wanted investors that I could choose who know biotech and therefore invest in biotech. That's one way of approaching the issue. The other is to sit here in India and continue to educate the current set of investors saying, please, this is, you know, worth your while. This is worth your, you know, a shot that you could take, etc. Today, the ecosystem in India is brilliant. The DBT is doing so much work. I mean, the Indian government is doing so much work in the entrepreneurial space. That was not the case in 2015 when I flipped. So today, I, I love to tell the tale that I regret I flipped and then I want to do this Tuglaki and move on moving back, which is a very, very expensive thing to do because, you know, you need to move assets, IP, everything. And I did it for a cost of $3 million. Today, I don't have $3 million to flip it back. 
right? I mean, I need to buy it back into the Indian entity. So this whole thing of, uh, I mean, uh, certain startups do very well with the flip and they have proven to do well. I hope to tell the same story, hopefully in two years from now that I did flip and I did the right move. Uh, but I also am very cognizant of how useful it is to be in India, how important it is to be in India. And I think somewhere deep down, uh, it's, it's very, it's a sense of pride that, you know, you, you're here in India doing work, you know, within uh, the Indian ecosystem. There is so much knowledge. There is uh, so much, uh, I want to say, enthusiasm of kind of getting there first, you know, kind of uh, seeing what progress could be within India. So I think for those reasons, you know, there is, there is, there is a lot of pride that I have that, you know, we are here. Uh, for all of the other commercial reasons, we are a U.S. company and I got to live with that. So what do you feel is very different from China versus India when it comes to developing these kind of therapies? Is it, is it the government funding? Is it, do you think there's any particular thing that India is really not doing more of to help uh, biotech companies to grow and uh, be as you know, competitive as the other countries are? So when it comes to when it comes to China and the rest of the world, I heard this really nice thing on the and you probably uh, you probably heard this. So while and and it goes like this: it says, "Well, the rest of the while the rest of the world is playing chess, China is playing Go." Correct? I mean, and that is so true, right? And so when it comes to China, forget biotech. I mean, whether it be world dominance, right? They have got plans which are a hundred years ahead, right? When you have plans that are 100 years ahead and not five to 10 years, you make bets and you make investments that are bombastic, correct? So it's not, it's not about, you know, biotech, biologics, will I, will I kind of build the next, you know, 20,000 liter fermenter or whatever. They have built out cities floating on oceans so that they could meet demands, correct? So I think their vision, especially in biotech, you know, leave alone other spaces, has, has been, you know, kind of phenomenal. How they decide to do what they do is, you know, kind of geopolitical stuff, which I don't want to get into. But I think for, for, for kind of democracies like ours, we have different issues that we have systemically faced. And to kind of battle that and say, this is how I measure progress is a different yardstick. You can't do, you can't measure it. It's not like to like, right? What you can do like to like is quality of product. That you can, and there are measures for that, and that you've got to live up to that standard. Correct? So I think that's more like it. And you know, and, and therefore I don't, how do you say, I, I don't have an opinion on the geopolitical stuff, but I do have an opinion on you know the economics of it, the, the viability of the quality of it, et cetera. Yeah. You you, you think the, the markets are more mature there to understand the long-term implications of whatever you're putting out as compared to anywhere in the world? I think the economies of scale work the best there. <laughs> it's probably, <laughs> right. It would probably work the best there. But with regard to, uh, I want to say, um, indications it meets of uh, purely innovation-driven stuff. Mm. At least with the little I know, I don't think it's 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 the same as probably the U.S or it's the same as some parts of Europe with regard to innovation. They have taken models and replicated it and shown the world that it's absolutely possible mm -hmm. to replicate it. I don't know if some of the models that they've created are purely originally their own, but then you could always say, who cares, right? It works. So who cares who got there first, right? So, I mean, those are, those are all philosophical debates, but yeah, this is what I think. The, one of the reasons I, I invited Kavita to talk to you, among the many reasons, is uh, if you wanted to start a new company yourself, be it in biotechnology or maybe open a you know pan shop next to your house, you know, I, I think that is the kind of question that I wanted you to sort of think about because you know she is a sort of role model for you and for me to say you know let's. Let's do this. Uh, let's take this risk and jump into the deep side and do it. So, so maybe, maybe if you think there's a question around that space you want to ask, I'll, I'll invite you to ask that kind of question. Okay, I'll make a comment on this because Naren said that. Sorry, Aprijita, I'll tell you this. So, Naren, when you know we were doing these complex, you know, kind of 
negotiations with Destem partners, trying to see who next we could license to, what you know, kind of data room driven conversations we could have, etc. This simple thing that gave me great joy over the weekend was my cousin does home cooking meals, right? I mean, she lost her job. And so she's been doing, she's an amazing home cook and she's been doing really nice, awesome Malayali food. And what they did was they just packed like 20, you know, parcels, literally like different carriers, like the, like the Dabba Wallas that you have in Bombay, different carriers. And I mean, I introduced them to my apartment complex and then we set up this whole Google Sheet form and then people did it. And we had business going, you know, amazing business and traction just in two days. That gave me such amazing pleasure. When you spoke about palm shop, I was thinking of this. The the you know the opportunity that is there right today is is amazing. You could do many things. I mean, biotech. Okay, that's that's what we have learned to do. So we do. Exactly, <laughs> ma'am. So that only I wanted to ask. Like, we should always have a plan B kind of thing when you are you know when you are actually thinking to do something in your lane, say I want to do something in biotech or something. And uh, so is there, uh, yeah, there is definitely, there is always, you know, a lot of uncertainty around. So did you had any, uh, your plan B or going back to, you know, uh, your uh, job or uh, you just I, and I, I, I used to tell my, I used to tell my investors this. See, I don't know something useful like carpentry or something, right? I, I only did biotech. I, 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 I'm not useful otherwise. <laughs> if you keep, you know, they did this in my first startup. They said, you know, these are the non-solicit, non-compete clauses, and they wrote everything in biotech possible in the non-compete clause. Then this is when I argued with them. I don't know anything. I, I can't cook. I, I can't, I can't do carpentry or plumbing. What do you want me to do? I can only do biotech, so I need to work. So you can't have these clauses. The same example, I didn't have a plan B. I mean, I don't have a plan B. We don't have opportune moments when, you know, kind of we grew up where like Naren, you know, Naren can give concerts and, you know, probably invite people over and have a plan B and C. But I don't have these. I can probably paint a bit, you know, or, or do something. It's more hobby-like. But I think in entrepreneurship, uh, the, the dive into the deep end is the risk. You don't think of a plan B when you're diving, right? You're not thinking, yeah. oh, no, 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 I will reach now eight feet. I don't want to go up to 16. I want to surface now. It doesn't work. You have to touch 16 and come up, right? So I think uh, it's a bit like that. If you go into it saying, I want a plan B, I'm not sure that works. But then if you're cognizant that, hey, I do need multiple plans because I'm involved not only in it, I have different people. I think there is also the whole, you know, kind of building around it that is very realistic, right? So to your, to your question, I knew very well, if this didn't work, I have to wrap it all up and go back to working, probably go back to Kiran and say, hey, I need a job. Yeah. And so there is, there is no, I, I, for me, there is no lack of dignity in eating humble pie. That, that I'm sure. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question and very good answer. And how much trust you should put on, like, yeah. And definitely trust is needed with people who you are uh, working and also. Uh, that's I think that's very important for any organization but how to you should blindly believe on someone or how much you should trust upon is there any mantra to that yeah no you live you learn right I mean my over second this startup you know kind of my co-founder flew the coop went to the US started another company and he was actually supposed to do kind of business development for this company etc things happen right I mean all of this it's like life takes over things happen people quit you know, people do other things and you learn. But then I think the, the, the mantra, so to speak, is I don't think there is, you can distrust and therefore say I am protective. You've got to trust and you've got to trust wholeheartedly. Things could happen that may not be what you envision, but then that's the only way to go forward, right? So, uh, you know, if you didn't take that leap of faith, I don't think you would move even one step forward. That's the way I would think. And I think over some time, experience also teaches you, you know, you you won't be too foolish. You might make some mistakes, but, you know, you won't kind of be off the deep end so much. Let's say if you had an idea or a concept or something that you want to develop into a business, hypothetically speaking, at what stage do you think, um, I think one issue that I would think personally, if I'm trying to develop something is, 
am I in the right stage? Do I have the right kind of knowledge to make this into something that could work as a company or a technology that's functional? So what do you do in that instance? Do you define like, this is the point I need some more experience perhaps in industry. I need to do some courses. So I need to have a more functional kind of, um, uh, what, what do you call a working kind of system to explain like, when do you start like dedicating your time solely into developing a technology or pharmaceutical or anything in that line? So I, I think it's very industry dependent, right? So if if you want to be, let's say, in the chai making space, you better know how to make chai. You can't you can't fake your way through that, right? So the, when is the right time to make the chai and to go and pitch to your investor? It's about you knowing the investor, you having you know scale. Do you do you make unique right. chai? Just you know some kadak chai wala you know, who is just like the other, you, you've got to differentiate yourself, right? I mean, I'm kind of oversimplifying this, but I'm just trying to tell you. In certain spaces, the competition or let's say the demand itself necessitates kind of people to jump into it. A good example is the mobility space before, before COVID hit, right? If you look at Zomato, if you look at Swiggy, if you look mm -hmm. at Dunzo, if you look at any of those people, there was captive markets that these guys who were in the e-com space just kind of took over that and said, 1.2 billion people, you know, there'll be three more startups in the mobility space that we can do, correct? Like, you know, last mile connectivity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's a captive space. Whereas in development spaces like ours, you have to kind of get to the edge of technology. Today, if you make a pitch in AI or ML, if you were in the fringe of it, nobody is going to take it, right? Because people know mm -hmm. it. So if you're in the Bitcoin space, you better know all of it. You better have enough backers in that space to kind of get into mm -hmm. it. I think it's contextually very, uh, uh, you know, kind of vertical or domain dependent, right? And therefore, you, you've got to know enough of that, at least have enough people or advisors or kind of, you know, enough people backing you on that saying, yes, I think you know enough, now is a good time to go, you know, kind of pitch or, or start. Ma'am, uh, like after uh, establishing yourself in this industry, suppose if a person, a completely new person uh, with, like, say, a uh, like newcomer is approaching you for its startup or something, so do you in future plan to invest in such startup? When I make the money, Narin, remember that. When <laughs> I make the money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have not yet made monies. I intend to make monies. And when I do, I, I definitely intend to invest in startups. Yeah. And then, and there are some spaces that are, you know, very dear to me and I would want to invest, but I still have to cut it. I still not made it as yet. Yeah. Kavita, it's a matter of time. Your perseverance in your marathon running is definitely going to bleed over to your, uh, to your work for sure. Uh, so, so um, again, any question? So far? I had uh, one, if we have time. Uh, I don't know how much time Kavita has. We are on the top of the hour. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay for another 10 minutes. Okay, okay. I have, I have several questions, but I, I have lots of opportunities to ask you those after, outside of this. But uh, so Surika, go ahead. Yeah, I, I had a question. You had mentioned that it's important to have your milestones uh, set and ready before you approach an investor as to what your endpoint is for your product. So my question to you is that after you pitch in these milestones and your idea to the investor and they're on board with it, how involved are they in the entire process while you're doing the work for it? Are right. they decaying or is it equal or... Yeah, so I think, uh, again, the filter to use is, are they investors who are from the same domain or space, right? And therefore they get really involved. But if they're not, they would typically track your spend, right? They will typically track, track time and spend because that's what they understand. Whereas if it's going to be investors in the biotech space, right? Mm -hmm. Like for example, think of it. If you folks were, were on an investment board and somebody had to come with you to, you know, and provide milestones, you will track the technology behind it. You will track it saying, you know, I think you guys are slow. You need to do these things faster. You will give some inputs, et cetera. So that is a tech, you know, kind of biology tech investor. They would track it like that. Whereas a pure financial investor would only look at, you know, have you hit milestones like the way you said you would? And at what point of time have you hit it, et cetera? So those would be the kind of things that, you know, they would say, yeah. 
Yeah. Good. Um, all right. So, um, if there are no other pressing questions, um, ma'am, uh, one more. Like, who is your role model? <laughs> I think, yeah. yeah so, uh, so it, this, this is this is an often asked question, and sometimes depending upon the phase in my life, it varies, right? So, I think uh, there is a lot to be said about the role that my mother and sister play, and with what they do. Um, so, yeah, I would say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, ma'am, am I audible? Yes. So uh, I want to know your vision, as in where you see yourself in the next five years, and how do you make sure that your startup don't turn irrelevant in the future? You know, right. how do you make sure that happens? I'm hoping it doesn't become irrelevant, just like the way we think, you know, the, the you know, oncology space will not, you know, kind of be irrelevant. But no, I think a specific to your question, uh, at least the, the vision that I've kind of put out and, and at least the, the, you know, I want to say the grit and endurance and we'd see this through is that in the next the same time next year, we want to IND file for our asset. And I think most of those kind of key milestones are in place and you know what it takes to do an IND filing. So I think that that part is in place. The monies are always in question. It will follow. We have some licensing opportunities, so that should see. So I want to say in two years from now, if we can try strategically kind of license some of the assets in the pipeline and get this lead asset into phase one, that's a vision that we have. So that's one part of it. Uh, how would how would how how will we make ourselves not irrelevant? Um, I think it's important to kind of choose assets, indications, the kind of market play that it has, therefore partners, etc. That would be one approach kind of to it, right? And and so you're constantly on the move. For example, we are spending a lot of money now buying reports with regard to this indication. Think. Is this the only combination or, or in monotherapy that it could be used or multiple other combinations and therefore what other work should we do, etc. So there's a lot of there's a lot of work with regard to being relevant, right? Because it's an ever-changing landscape. And so yeah, so that that work is getting done. And there's a lot of money and time invested in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good. Um so Kavita, I think um, we're running out of time. So wh why don't we sort of close with some comments from you, and then uh, I'm going to connect you. Uh, if, if anybody's interested, I'll connect. I'll give you. Uh, I'll give them your contact information. So if there's any specific personal questions that they want to ask, they can ask you offline. But any yeah. final comments from you then before we close? No, so I thank you so much for having me. It's been a it's been a pleasure connecting with you folks. And uh, you know, if if uh, my urge would be that you know you you don't do the the usual spiel of you know trying to think all of what you kind of either work in your PhDs or kind of work forward is linear. Try and do things a little exponential because I think that is the need of the R. Being very constructive linearly is only going to get you some somewhere someplace in a, in some time but i think this you should shake it up a bit <laughs> i hope you do it in your own way right yeah okay great thank you again everyone thank you kavita again i've i ask you this question thank you i recorded the session for people who generally want to hear it later on <laughs>